Hi, everyone. We're back again with a special guest, Elijah Manley. He ran for a state representative campaign in Florida at the age of 21. Elijah? Thank you guys for having me on the show. Uh, I'm Elijah Manley. I ran for state representative uh, in Florida, in South Florida, in our 94th House District, uh, which consists of most of uh, central Broward County. Um, I ran that campaign uh, as a 21 year old progressive candidate uh, against a longtime incumbent who never had a challenger for the seat before. Yeah, how was it like, um, like how was the campaign like? What, what ended up happening? Like what were your experiences like? It was an interesting campaign. Um, I was obviously a progressive candidate, um, whereas my uh, opposition, um, Representative DeBose, was a more moderate Democrat uh, who was uh, uh, been in the seat for several uh, years. Before that, he was a city commissioner. Um, it was a different type of campaign this year because of coronavirus um, and the pandemic's effect on fundraising, effect on just about anything. Uh, we ended up uh, falling short by a couple thousand votes uh, in the in the race, unfortunately. Um, I don't fault myself for my campaign for that. I think it was a really uh, a different time to run a, camp a political campaign. Um, in this country, and it was really difficult this year. Uh, so you, we just yeah. had to adapt with the tools we had and kind of go from there. That makes sense. Do you think it would have been different had it been like on like not not the year of COVID? Like what different campaigns would you have used if it wasn't okay. virtual? Absolutely. I think it would have been a lot better. We, will, we would have had more opportunities to knock doors, to have uh, events, rallies, town halls, in-person town halls. We kind of had to go completely virtual for the most part. And uh, most of the voters in our district, most people who vote for super voters here are older voters who may not be technologically astute. So we kind of had to uh, focus our efforts on reaching the people who were people who uh, use Facebook, running ads um, to target people um, on Facebook, on Instagram, target young voters. I think if we did not see a global pandemic this year, um, we would have been able to do so much more. We would have been able to reach so many more voters. And we would have been able to raise a lot more money as well. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, you know, campaign finance is incredibly important, especially for progressive candidates who do not rely on money from corporations or super PACs. Um, it was incredibly difficult. Most people were out of work. Uh, they could not afford to donate more than maybe 5 or $10 to the campaign. So that kind of had a, a big effect on us, whereas our only tools were literally playing their game of sending mail and uh, virtual campaigning, which no one really had any idea how to do going into this. Mm -hmm. What do you think were like the main issues that you focused on throughout your campaign? I focused on uh, infrastructure, which was incredibly important in our district. Uh, you all might have heard um, maybe on national or international news about Fort Lauderdale and our major water uh, crisis, our uh, water main breaks. Uh, so I focused on stuff like that. Um, talking about how we could have sustainable development because we have a lot of high rises going up and not a lot of money going into fixing um, our under underground water mains, um, ensuring that our infrastructure is up to par. Um, but I also talked about climate change, which a lot of people didn't think had a lot to do with our district, but it really did um, because climate change is just, you know, um, sea level uh, rising, which is important for South Florida. Um, it's also everything is how we develop uh, housing to um, who gets hit the, the worst by hurricanes uh, every hurricane season. So I spoke a lot about that, including environmental policy, water quality. Water quality is incredibly important because South Florida, uh, we receive our, 8 million people receive our uh, water supply from the Biscayne Aquifer, which is uh, threatened by fracking, by sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Um, Everglades restoration I focused on, but outside of those issues, I tried to tackle the issues that affected people the most this year from healthcare. Uh, which was big. A lot of people's uh, health care was tied to their employment. Um, and a lot of people don't have health care anymore because they're not employed. But we also talked about the unemployment system in Florida, which we all know is incredibly, <laughs> incredibly negligent um, and uh, not functional. So I, I tied all of those issues into a central theme in the campaign that the government is not working for everyone and that, uh, you know, everyday people um, in our country um, and in our district, specifically here in South Florida, are hurting and the government's nowhere to be found. Um, the government's too busy bailing out uh, rich people and airlines than they are focusing on getting people the uh, tools that they need.
Yeah, for sure. I, I'm actually from Florida myself, so it was really great to see this campaign like unfold because there really aren't a lot of uh, young or progressive candidates in most of the like most of the Democratic districts. Um, so I was curious, what was what, what do you think are the main differences between you and like between being a progressive candidate and being and like the moderate candidates that normally end up winning races in Florida? I, I think the the biggest was definitely that I'm a young person and that's not normal to see in politics to see someone 21 running for uh public office Mm -hmm. but outside of of just being young i think my politics was definitely different than a lot of the more mainstream democrats um my focus was primarily on helping working class people it wasn't in the game of climbing up the political ladder or you know dealing with political consultants or that entire uh, machine politics mindset. It was uh, more uh, of a focus on helping everyday people. So I think that was a big, uh, that was the big difference between me and most other, uh, uh, most other people who were running for office during that time. I was incredibly young and enthusiastic, I think. I hope so, <laughs> I try to be at the very minimum. Um, but I think the other obvious major difference was uh, fundraising. Um, we did manage to raise nearly sixty thousand dollars, but almost all of it was from small dollar donors, uh, people who gave five or ten bucks. Uh, we had no corporations or super PACs give us money. It was all a grassroots campaign, um, and one of the most grassroots campaigns uh, uh, for just about anyone. I think most people running uh, this cycle uh, did not get that many individual donors. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um... Talking about campaign finances, I'm actually not really well versed within it. I never really think about it when it comes to like campaigns. I did an internship with the ACLU, so like I was tracking different campaign finances this summer, for, like the primaries in Florida. But uh, what what ends up like? What do you pay money for when you're in a campaign? A campaign is like a business in many ways. Is you got to hire people, you got to sign contracts with firms to do specific uh, things for the campaign. Um, and it's a lot of advertising. We poured a lot of money into social media advertising. We poured a lot of money into mailers, sending mail to people, which is one of the most effective ways of reaching people. I kind of think otherwise, though. Um, we put money into phone banking software uh, to reach people. A lot of virtual stuff, too. Uh, I mean, I think one of the biggest campaign expenditures this year for politics was Zoom. Like, <laughs> literally, we were able to, to pay for Zoom so you could uh, hold virtual town halls. Um, you spend the money on a lot of things, uh, transportation for volunteers, uh, food for co-workers. Um, it's like a business. You got to keep it going. You got to keep it flowing. Um, and you end up spending a lot of money on those things. But this year it was a little different because um, traditionally you would spend money on other get out the vote measures. And our money was specifically spent on as much virtual stuff as we could um, to, to kind of reach people. I suppose, like, going off into a different stream, when did you end up deciding to run for, for rep? Uh, it was late last year, I uh, uh, 2019. I did not want to run for anything, to be honest, at that time. I just wanted to relax. I was getting ready to turn 21, so it was going to be, to me, a big party year, <laughs> figure out what I was going to do, maybe go away for school and try to enjoy the college experience, transfer to a state university or something. I just kind of was just, you know, going at the moment. And um, I just, you know, as I looked around, I just saw uh, like just really disturbed me stuff from student homelessness to uh, infrastructure failings, uh, uh, just to a lot of issues. And I asked myself, what could I do? What what can I actually do to, to address this? Um, and I was going to run for the school board uh, uh, again, because I ran for school board in 2018, actually. So I was going to run for school board again, and then I was like, you know, I'm tired. I just want to like be 21, 2021, 20, go party, go to the club, just relax. Um, and then I just tried to, I, you know, I tried to address a, a homelessness issue down here. And when I tried to do that, it doesn't, it didn't seem like anyone really cared. Like any of the politicians cared about anything I was saying. Um, so I asked myself, what could I do? So I started, you know, joking around with the incumbent. Uh, just saying, I'm gonna run for your seat. I'm gonna run for your seat. But it was a joke at the time. I didn't think I actually was going to. And he just didn't respond. He was just like, okay, and just really didn't respond. Uh, so I said, you know what? Forget it. I, 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 okay, then I'll actually run. Um, I'm gonna run for a different district, but then I end up running for this district. 
And there are a lot of people who, you know, you know, ahead of that, I thought to myself, maybe this isn't the right move. Maybe just finish college, maybe come back stronger with your degree, with more accolades. Uh, they experience all of that stuff, go enjoy life a little bit. And then I just remember what uh, my mentor said. I had a mentor who passed away in 2018, uh, right before I uh, finished the school board race. And uh, she told me to make a promise that I would run in 2020 um, for something, most likely school board. I didn't really want to, to be honest, but um, I thought about that at the time. And I said, you know, what would she want me to do? Um, and I decided to run, you know, the most that can happen is you lose, which ended up happening, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think it was important for my voice to be on the ballot that year. I mean, especially with everything we're seeing this year from the riots to the, the unrest uh, to the racial tensions in this country. I think it was important to have a voice like mine, young uh, queer person of color on the ballot talking about the issues that really matter in this country and to, the, and to our state, which is definitely no angel when it comes to racial, uh, uh, racial tensions. Um, so... I think it was incredibly important when or lose that I had my voice out there at least. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm very, very happy you ended up running. It was just honestly such an inspiration to see a young politician in Florida. Um, talking about like the George Floyd, the race riots, et cetera. What was like what was your experience like in Fort Lauderdale? Uh, well actually I have no idea where you're from. I was thinking Fort Lauderdale, sorry. Um, but Florida. in South Florida. Yes, absolutely. It's uh I'm from Fort Lauderdale too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm from Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're neighbors then. <laughs> um, I, I mean, when it first happened, protests started occurring everywhere in the country and we were looking around and it was kind of common for a lot of those efforts. And then out of nowhere, protests started popping up everywhere throughout Broward. There was a major protest in downtown for a lot of those that made headlines. Um, I was at the, the protest. Uh, I got tear gassed um, <laughs> really badly, had the worst headache of my lifetime that night. Um, I, I was at that protest. It was actually a really peaceful protest um, that I think the organizers did a really good job conducting. And of course, uh, the cops at the end kind of escalated tensions at the end of the protest. And I got tear gas. A lot of my friends did. But I saw a lot of first time protesters, like first time people who never, because I'm involved with the Black Lives Matter Alliance here in Broward. So I saw a lot of like first time um, people who really came out of the woodworks and, and were active. Um, and it was just thousands of people and there were every day there were protests in different places in the county. Um, but the one in Fort Lauderdale was a little different. I mean, there was a person there who got, uh, shot with like a, a rubber bullet, um, in, in her head. Um, so we got to see some of the, some really bad things and we really got to see intentions grow. There was a curfew. Um, they were arresting people, you know, if you were out past the curfew, um, it, it, you couldn't protest. I mean, it was, it was really different. And I've been to a lot of protests myself. I mean, I was at the J20 protest in DC that kind of turned into a riot after Trump was elected. Um, and, you know, this was, this was different because there's a lot of raw emotion and anger. Um, and it wasn't to some like abstract things such as, you know, a Trump election or anything it was really focused on tangible things like you know, we, we, you know, everything from defunding the police to look, this is what they're doing in Broward County to people. These are the people they killed in Broward County. These are the, fam the families who no longer have their son and daughters. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that, do you think that North Fort Lauderdale was treated differently than other um, places in Florida? Because I remember going to like protests, say, in like Parkland, and it was very, very different than the environment in Fort Lauderdale or like Coral Gables or even like down south, like further down in Miami. Yeah, it was treated a lot different. Um, I think. They were the, the cops were more prone to attacking the uh, protesters there because they were mostly people of color. There were a lot of white people there too. It was a it was a really uh, beautiful protest because it was really diverse. And there were a lot of people of color there. There were a lot of people from the surrounding neighborhoods who never were mobilized ever mm -hmm. to participate in anything that were there. And um, I know the cops didn't really like that um, a lot. Um, and, you know, they tried to frame it as they were rioting and because a window got smashed or something. But I really I just highly doubt that because the protest I was in and I was a marshal for because I was actually a marshal in that protest was really peaceful. Uh, it was really uh, it, it gave space for people to really, you know, talk about their emotions, to connect with other people and really, you know, uh, address their trauma. Um, 
and there's not a lot of spaces for people. So you saw people screaming and yelling, but that wasn't screaming and yelling in a violent way or anything. There was people getting out anger that they really had because someone else had been killed. And this goes on every day and police don't go to jail for it. Of course, but that that sounds it, it was it was awful. Honestly, like, near the end, it was it was really violent. I remember it being just a lot. <laughs> um, but I was I'm curious because I struggled with this decision myself. What made you decide to go out and protest as opposed to like staying home because COVID is obviously still a risk, especially in Florida. My campaign office was actually a couple blocks from where the protest was going to happen. So at first, I didn't want to go. I'm like, they're gonna tear gas us, and I don't know, and. I don't want it to turn into a riot and everything, even though I've been to like so many other like protests. Um, but then I thought to myself, everyone I know is going, is right down the street, and like this is like the most I could be doing right now outside of like running. This is the most I could be doing, like at a protest, marshalling, helping out, um, and 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 making my voice heard. So I decided to go out, and you know, it turned out to be a really really big protest. Um, lots of people there. Um, it was tiring. We marched all the way to the police department and back. Um, but I saw I got uh, it's a lot of space. I got to connect with people who just I never knew before, but they were out for the same reasons. They might have got tear gas their first protest, mm -hmm. um, and you get to see the human element of it too. Like people just really like their emo their inner emotions about something really you know hurt what happened, and there's no other place you can really do that. Like you can't do that at work. Uh, you can't do that at school too much. So people were in a space with other people who felt the same way, and they were able to talk that, talk that out, and get it out in their own way um, without hurting anyone else. And they, and to me, that was healthy, regardless of what anyone tries to say or what the president tries to say. It was really healthy. Yeah, I suppose like some for some things just matter more than the risk of a disease. Which I, I completely understand. Like I made the same decision at the same time. Do you think that Florida organized? Like, I, or, like, the last time I've seen South Florida organized so much in, like, terms of protests and marches was after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Do you think it happened in a similar vein, or was there, like, different forms of organizing that happened here than before? I think it was different types of organizing. Like, I think after Stoneman Douglas, it was a lot more, I, I don't I can't even find the words for it. I mean, it, it was an important, important thing, March for Our Lives, and it talked about important things, but this was less political and more like personal, I, I would say. This was, you know, you know, of course there were political aims we were all aiming for. There were things we we of course wanted to, you know, talk about like defunding police, how we're uh, you know, training how police officers are trained, the criminal justice system. But to me this was uh, this was a little bit different. This was real. This was really real. Like I'm not saying March for our lives is fake or anything. It's just there were elements of it I think were just a lot different from what like I would expect. Yeah. Plus, like the media, like how the media kind of handled this was different. Like this was all rioting and looting, whereas you know with March for Our Lives is more of you know these kids are brave and you know they're talking about what happened and you know the shootings and the guns and all of this and the violence. But this was violent to the media, um, although this was just normal and healthy, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree with the different for the was, I mean, I would say the only similar thing was a lot of the organizing was young people. Like a lot of those big marches and rallies, like down here at least, and across the country, I knew a lot of people who were doing it were organized by like high school students. Like, <laughs> like before in our county, there was not many like high school students organizing like protests. We saw a lot of that. We saw like three or four different ones, like of high school students organizing like BLM marches in Broward County, oh. and that was that was really good. I, mean, I remember going to a, a, a virtual like information session by Dream Defenders about how to organize. I thought that was really, really helpful and definitely I think inspired a lot more people to go out and organize. Um, as like what what was your first experience like going to protest and activism? I'm curious. I was really young <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I first went out. I'm trying to remember was it like twelve or thirteen when I first went. Um, and uh, the first time I went, like, I guess I was expecting it to be more, like, like violent and, like, screaming and yelling in the middle of the street, blah, blah, blah. I was kind of scared to go. Um, but I'm so glad I got to go early on in my life to really experience this. So I can know, like, this is not violence. This is, like, 
democracy actually. This is what democracy actually looks like. People speaking up uh, about the things that are really happening. Um, and, you know, I got there. I, I still remember the day I went to my first, like, uh, protest. This is a long time. It must have been, like, right after Occupy, but it was, like, it was actually right after the Trayvon Martin shooting. Um, and um, I just remember seeing, like, you know, there were a bunch of people there. It was smaller than this, of course. Um, and there were a lot of police. Like, it was a lot of people there, but not like what I saw in Fort Lauderdale this year. But there were a lot more police in the way they were, like, treating people. I'm, like, you know, at a young age, I'm, I was trying to process all of that and understand, like, why they needed that much police there and what was the point of them having like batons and like zip ties and like mace to like attack people yeah yeah and in in the wake of like the trayvon martin shooting um i I do think there wasn't as much protest or rights i was like pretty young so maybe i just didn't care about it as much but do you think like momentum has been developing more and more like throughout the years i think uh i think yeah i think a lot more has yes um I think it's been continuous, like it's just been continuous. This is just happening over and over again. And now we have the incredible toll of like social media and the cameras where people are catching this stuff, but there's a lot more work where like people now have like the lens to look at this, not just from the lens of like, this is happening, but people are documenting this and they're talking about it more. And there are people who are keeping track of these murders. Um, There are people keeping track of all of this and there are people talking about it um before 2012 i guess there were some elements of that but not in the same way as it is now like if someone was the if an officer was to shoot someone dead now like we would know in a few hours we would figure it out because we have like people out there that look for this stuff and that report it um and now it's a key you know it's something that's talked about in the media a lot now too so it's more attention to on it than it was before because we kind of forced that attention on this subject um and uh because we forced attention on this subject i think um we we're now catching everything that kind of happens everywhere and that's good in a way uh in many ways um that's good because now we know when it's happening we know if these officers are being arrested or they're just getting away with it and as a result we can do direct uh action yeah no, for sure. I think like there's been more of a momentum of like a national movement that's fueled by social media because that's a platform, like different platforms where people can come together and organize different in different parts of the country. But I'm curious, since you ended up running for like a local election, how important do you think like local elections are to of uh, criminal justice reform or like uh, police reform? I think it's more important than anything else. It's definitely more important than the presidential election and then national stuff. I know some people might kind of think not, mm-hmm. uh, but it is in the sense that most of the control over actual reform over these entities come down to your local level, to your mayors, to the city council people, to the actual like state attorneys and or DAs you elect, to the sheriffs that we, we vote into office, to the state representatives and state senators who help fund uh, these police departments and cities to who we elect on the state level. Members of Congress don't really have as much like control over that as we think. Senate, uh, you know, U.S. senators and U.S. representatives, the president doesn't have direct control over that as much. They can kind of make things a lot worse with their mouth and with their Justice Department. Um, but it comes down to like, okay, an officer killed someone. Who do you want as the prosecutor? Someone who is controlled by police unions and doesn't ever prosecute an officer for doing this, or someone who will investigate and charge these officers for killing people? Who do you want as the sheriff? Someone who is a hawk? Um, how should we fund the sheriff's department? Should it be you know over a billion dollars like Broward County, nearly a billion dollars, or should we be putting more of that money in? To housing and to opportunities and the social services, who's the mayor and the city council, people who are going to vote on this, the state representatives and state senators who pass the laws that give police officers immunity when they kill people. These are the most important positions. So while everyone's focused on the presidential election, which is important to focus on this year, we need to be focusing on these local elections as well. Uh, you know, we just had the primaries I ran in on August 18th. Barely anyone voted in a primary. Like the turnout was so low, it was it was just really depressing. Youth turnout, youth, the youth voter turnout was 8%. 
everything else was still less than 20%. Like no one voted. And everyone was talking about November, November, get Trump out, but they forgot the most important elections were actually two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, yeah. the most important elections. We're going to get a new prosecutor. Thankfully, it's not going to be the worst option in that race, but we're getting a new prosecutor. Mm-hmm. We got a new sheriff. We got a new, uh, 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 we got new people in just about every office now. We got new state reps and new, senator, new state senators. Some of the choices were not good. Mm-hmm. But people got to remember that these local elections actually determine how we live our everyday lives. And they actually have more power over us. So our action should be to change that before we try to change what's happening nationally because that's the whole cookie like <laughs> we can't eat that whole cookie ourselves by ourselves yeah i focused a lot on like down ballot elections like sheriffs state, state supervisor of elections state attorneys etc um so i I'd actually focus on the broward county election and then the orange county and osceola orange and osceola county elections and it's actually it's, it's very interesting the differences i think the biggest controversy at least in orange county was about the death penalty I'm not sure if the same controversy brought up in Broward County, because originally there was a prosecutor in Orange County where they were like, we're not going to probably use the death penalty. And then DeSantis ended up moving all of the cases that were like having to do with the death penalty to a different county. So what were the main issues in like the Broward County state attorney uh, race? I think the, some of the biggest ones were definitely like the war on drugs, like marijuana, Texas, um, and I think most of the candidates actually were saying that they're not going to prosecute like low level like drug offenses or like marijuana possession, which was good. And then we had one um, who actually was okay prosecuting people for that and was actually in the office prosecuting people for that. So mm-hmm. that was one of the biggest distinctions. But the other um, was definitely uh, having to do with uh, police uh, involved shootings was a big thing um, or police misconduct in general was a big discussion um and it so i think those two were definitely like the biggest but the other uh, outside of that it would definitely be like the school to prison pipeline like officers on school campuses and what should we do when those when students are arrested like what should our uh response to that be yeah that was the big controversy between, like gregory tony and scott israel like who has done more for the school to prison pipeline what's the best method to prevent like tragedies like douglas happening again what what do you think like your role if you had ended up winning the election your role as state as a state representative would have been in like terms of criminal justice reform? Right, so I think I would have been introducing legislation on it. I don't think the legislation would have passed obviously with the Republican control in D.C. But I think like the point of my running wasn't just to get the legislation passed. Uh, it was to also bring attention to these things and be loud. Like what we have now in the legislature, there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable talking about. It's even Democrats like like establishment Democrats who don't want to talk about like, how do we move money away from police? Or how do we tackle like police misconduct? There's a lot of people who are still not comfortable talking about that. And they take support from police unions and the PBA. So I think like my role in that position would be to kind of serve as like, at least for the movement, like be a representative for the movement, like talk about these things and try to try to get something done on it. Even if I ended up not getting anything done on it because you would want someone in that position that would be willing to say, introduce bills and say mm-hmm. this is what we need to do and not give a damn what the police union has to say. And yeah, it's like a redirection to questions that aren't answered, aren't asked much in Florida. I, mean, I think my other, my other role in the position would be like outside of the legislature, like unifying people, like and holding like the municipal governments to account, like making sure like our cities if officers are having uh, or doing things that are disgusting and engaging in misconduct, then I think it will be incredibly important for me as a representative to call up the mayor and the commissioners and say, hey, this just happened in this district in your city. We need this officer removed. Like imagine how it would be if, or how different things would be if state representatives and state senators actually stood up and called out the mayors and the city commissioners when someone was shot or murdered or attacked or police misconduct occurred. And you have activists and people in the community saying, we need to get these officers off the force. Imagine the amount of 
change it will bring if you actually have like your state representatives, your state senators echoing that call. Uh, they're powerful. They bring money home to those cities. So those cities are going to listen to what they have to say. Yeah, it would be a completely different world, especially in Florida. Um, so next next election cycle, do you think you're going to plan on running again? I haven't made up my mind. Um, I got some time, but I mean, it all depends on what really happens with uh, redistricting. I mean, after the census is over, they have to redraw the districts um, next year. So uh, it all depends on that and, you know, how I'm feeling when I get closer to the election. If there's, if I see myself better in other ways or in other, um, um, focusing on other things, then I'll probably do that. But I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. it, it you sure. know, it's, <laughs> it's a lot about and campaigns take up a lot of energy and time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still kind of recuperating from all of that right now. But <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And what would you say to other like young politicians or people who want to get involved in politics and actually run for a, a, a official position? I say give it your best shot. <laughs> the worst that can happen is you lose. And losing is not the, the worst thing to happen, especially when you're young. Like, you know, you're going to win some races, you're going to lose some races. And they're not lose. They're not technically. You're not technically losing anything. They're just setbacks, and setbacks happen. But anything that ever has happened, any progress that ever has happened, took time. Like it took really hard work and people really going at it over and over and over again. So I say, you know, it's hard and get prepared to work your butt off. But at the end, you're gonna look back and say, this actually wasn't as hard as I thought it was. I learned a lot. You learn a lot. You don't just learn about, you know. An election, you really start to learn about more about yourself as a human being and about other people's struggles, things you did not know and things you did not understand. So, to anyone out there that's thinking about running, think about it and do it. Just do it, honestly. And yeah. you never know, you might surprise yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So, no regrets running, even if it wasn't that win. Nope, it was all worth it. And every single moment I spent was worth it. Every conversation I had was worth it. Every dollar we spent was worth it. Every person we spoke with was worth it. Every vote we got was worth it. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Elijah, for coming on this podcast. We really, really appreciate it. You're an absolutely amazing figure in Florida and I'm sure in the nation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.